Hi, my name is Alex Gasano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society and today we will be having as our guest speaker Heather Turby Brown. She's from the uh, Henry B. Plant Museum in Tampa, which is formerly the Tampa Bay Hotel and is now the University of Tampa. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this morning. My name is Heather Brown, and I'm the Curator of Education at the Henry Plant Museum over in Tampa. And so I really appreciate Alex inviting me to be with you this morning, and so thanks for coming out. As Curator of Education, I do a lot in the museum, working with our curator and registrar to develop the exhibits that we put up and the narrative that goes along the text panels and the written material. And then I work with our tour coordinator to train docents so they can guide tours for our adults and our younger visitors. And then I also write the grants. But one of the, the exciting things that I get to do is as the curator of education, I get to go into the community and share the history of Henry Plant and the Tampa Bay Hotel. And so I really enjoy that because it gets me out of the office. <laughs> um, I get to meet people and I get to, again, share the information. So, um, so I love talking about it. And had, how many of you have actually been to the Henry Plant Museum? Okay, more than half, great. Have the rest of you at least heard of the museum? Okay. Well, we are open, um, and so if you'd like to make a, a trip across the bay, please do come and see us. Um, but also, I'm hoping when you, those of you who have been there came, did you go on a tour or was it self-guided when, when you went? Self-guided? Self okay. So hopefully today I'll be sharing some information with you that is not part of our text panels in the museum and also some historic photographs that aren't normally on display in the museum. We do, even though it's a very large building, 511 rooms originally when it opened in 1891 as the Tampa Bay Hotel, it's the part of the museum is only about 15 rooms <laughs> that are open to the public. So hopefully I'll, I'll be sharing some photographs and some information that was not on the tour. And um, for those of you who haven't been, hopefully you'll see us soon. So this is a modern day picture of the Tampa Bay Hotel and the museum is, the Henry Plant Museum is located there on the first floor of the south wing. And before we can really talk about the hotel, I need to introduce you to Henry. Henry was born in Connecticut into a farming family in 1819. And at a young age, he decided he wasn't interested in the farming lifestyle. He was more interested in transportation and ships. So he got a job working as a cabin boy on a steamship and he was put in charge of the express packages. And his responsibility was to make sure that those packages, once on board ship, stayed secure and safe. And then they made it off the ship safely when the ship reached port. And he developed a great interest in this. He showed his employers that he was very good at doing this. And he worked his way up through the ranks until he eventually had a supervisory position with the Adams Express Company. And things were going very well for Henry um, up until 1861. Civil War breaks out. Um, he had been put in charge, because being a superintendent of the Adams Express Company, he'd been put in charge of the southern division of the Adams Express Company that was headquartered in Augusta, Georgia. Well, 1861, the Civil War comes. The Adams Express Company, being a northern company, thinks maybe this is not a good idea, that we're not going to be able to stay in the south. And so their Adams Express Company is planning to leave, and Plant sees this as an opportunity, and he says, I would like to purchase the Southern Division of the Adams Express Company. And that's what he does. He buys it, he renames it the Southern Express Company, a very suitable name considering the, the circumstances. And that's the first company he owns. And he's president of the, uh, the Southern Express Company up until his death. And this is where he really gets a foothold into land transportation. Because when he was with the Adams Express Company, he was primarily working with shipping. But their southern division was mostly on land. And so he develops that land transportation throughout the southeastern United States during the Civil War. When the war ends, he realizes that transportation is, is a big mess um, as a result of war. So he starts purchasing rail lines that are going bankrupt 
and connecting them to his existing transportation lines, and he starts expanding throughout the southeastern United States. And that's where he begins to establish his plant system of rail lines. So he has rail lines running throughout South Carolina, Georgia, and um, Alabama, and he starts to look at Florida. And, he and this is about 1870s. And he realizes Florida has a lot of potential, but not a developed transportation infrastructure. So he starts laying railroad tracks into Florida and purchasing smaller rail lines and connecting them. So he's developing a more expansive network throughout the Southeast, but he's also connecting Florida with the rest of the United States as one continuous line of, of rail. Now, there, there was a lot of incentive for Plant to be building rail lines in Florida, and Florida really wanted transportation to happen. They were offering land grants for a lot of the rail development, uh, a little over 3,000 acres. I think it was 3,840 acres of land would be awarded to anybody who could lay one mile of track. So in, in the 18, early 1880s, that's, that's a lot. Even though Florida at the time, their real estate was not that expensive compared to some other parts, compared <laughs> to some other parts of the United States. And so, um, so to get over 3,000 acres for putting down a mile of track, that was a pretty nice pay. There was one particular stretch that the state of Florida was really interested in developing, and that was the section from, um, that was part of the Jacksonville Tampa Key West line that ran from Kissimmee to Tampa. It was about 70 miles. They really wanted this put in. Other uh, railroaders had tried to do it and had failed, and Plant took the challenge. And part of this, to sweeten the pot on the part of the state, they were willing to award over 13,000 acres for one mile of track to anybody who could complete. They had to complete that 70 miles. You could do 60, 69 miles of track, but you wouldn't get the award. You had to complete the entire 70 miles. So Plant took the challenge and he had a deadline. I think it was about six months to do this. So he started a crew working at both ends and with two days to spare they met and he completed it. So he did receive that that land grant for 13,000 of acres, um, 13,840 acres for each mile of that 70 miles he put down. But Plant wasn't really interested in in amassing land. He wasn't in the real estate business. He was really interested in infrastructure. So with, with that land he was amassing, he developed a, a land company and he was selling off the land to help finance railroad development, but then also some of the land did provide access to connecting his rail lines. But uh, again, land development was not his, his interest. Which brings us to Tampa. Plant had started out, as I mentioned, in the shipping business. That's where he got his start. He was familiar with it. He had established some shipping lines that were running out of Boston up into Canada before he came south. So he never forgot shipping. And he was really looking at how to make the connection between land and sea. So as he was developing rail lines throughout the southeast, he was really also looking for a port destination because he wanted to connect his steamship lines with his land transportation. So he was looking at for points on the west coast of Florida and he comes to Tampa and he thinks there's a lot of opportunity here. But Tampa's not very developed in the early 1880s. We see this picture here. Uh, this is, um, I forget which streets in downtown Tampa, but two of the major roads through downtown. And this is 1882 and it says the population is 400. So if any of you have been to Tampa lately, this is not what it looks like. Uh, it's hard to tell in the picture, but these are dirt roads too. They're not paved, they're not even um, boarded or bricked, it's dirt. And um, just a few houses. So very, very small, but Plant saw this as potential. And he started to also, um, so Plant brings the railroad into Tampa in 1884 and Tampa starts to grow and develop. So once, once he gets the railroad into Tampa, he starts to look at the port, which, oh, I don't think this works on TV, but you've got downtown Tampa, 
and then down the peninsula is about nine miles and it comes down to the port and this port was was not very developed it was a small port large steamships like what plant had started working on when he was a young man couldn't have have made a dock there they would have to weigh anchor about a mile offshore and a tug would have to go out and ferry cargo and things back and forth so plant thinking about this realizes if I can develop this if I put my rail line out um, a little ways into the bay and dredge it out large steamships will be able to access this port and that's what he did so there he had connected the rail lines and the steamship lines in Tampa and this then became very efficient for transportation as well as tourists because now with a port being at Tampa people had a way tourists had a way to get to Tampa by train or by steamship they could get on in New York Boston down to Savannah um, and then come on down either around Florida or across land on train so now with the transportation lines cargo coming in too from the Caribbean and points across the Gulf of Mexico had easy access to rail transportation much more efficient and the industries that were here in, in on the western part of Florida could really benefit from both the rail and the steamship lines because now they have access to to markets further away and they can also ship in greater quantities and by the time plant completed the port in 1887 27 of these large steamships could all be in port at the same time so with plants steamship lines as I mentioned he had established some lines running out of Boston up into Canada and he ran those during the summer months in the winter months he would run steamships out of Port Tampa down to Key West Cuba Jamaica across to Mobile and um, different different years it, it changed but to some other points in the Caribbean but he established a, a rail or a steamship line out of Port Tampa and the other thing that really helped to to boost Florida's economy was the discovery of phosphate it had been discovered in the 1850s here in Florida and with bringing the rail line and the steamship line now phosphate companies had ways to, to transport tons tons of phosphate uh, to Europe to um, up into the United States up to Atlanta to some of the major phosphate factories and across the Gulf of Mexico so even though uh, plants steamship lines didn't transport phosphate by opening the port and having the rail lines other companies could transport phosphate through through that infrastructure and so this is just a, another image of one of his steamships and then at the bottom it's a really great image bringing the, the port together you've got the tourists clearly in their travel clothes as opposed to laborers who are moving cargo you've got the train and then you've got um, I think it's a steamboat actually behind them but all of that activity now at the port and another development then with plant putting in the developing the port and having the rail lines a man named Mr. Ebor became very interested in this part of the state he had a cigar factory down in Key West and he was wanting to relocate and he looked at Tampa and and decided eventually to to put move his factories up just west of Tampa or east of Tampa just a little bit um, because of the access to the fresh tobacco leaves he, plant steamships did travel weekly to Cuba and could transport fresh tobacco leaves back to the port and then um, load those onto the trains the trains would take them up to what became Ybor City and cigar factories could roll the the cigars and then export the cigars either on steamship or train to other points and so because Mr. Ebor moved his factory there then other cigar manufacturers followed suit and that's why that area really developed as a cigar manufacturing capital of the world for a period of time and plant was not only uh, a good businessman in trying to make these connections and have vision and foresight to make it all connect but he also advertised well so once he had the steamships and the railroads tourists could get here 
he wanted to make sure tourists really understood how easy it was. And so on the left hand side, we have a map showing some steamship lines out of New England coming down the eastern coast of the United States to uh, Savannah and Brunswick, and then steam uh, train lines connecting across Florida down to the port. And then if you wanted to continue on to a Caribbean vacation, you could easily do that. And if you had any doubt about your ability to do so via the plant system, the brochure on the right clearly says how you can reach all these fabulous points on plants over 5,000 miles of transportation lines. So he made it very clear for, for folks considering travel. And if, if the practical side of knowing how easy it is wasn't effective, take the romantic approach. On the brochure on the left, I, I love this one because the graphics show the polar bear up in the chilly north with his suitcase packed it up, is ready to head down to the sultry breezes of the Caribbean and Florida to sit beneath a, a tropical palm, sipping a fabulous drink. Um, and it's hard to see in this, but this alligator has some very wonderful slippers on. So they're right there, nice and red. So, uh, so if you had any doubt about that, the graphics would get you. And then on the right-hand side, definitely a more romantic idea, the Victorian lady in her, her travel suit um, standing underneath of a palm tree, palm tree, breeze blowing, and off in the distance there's a steamship headed for some exotic port. So this wonderful vacation image could be yours via the plant system. And that's all great. Plant made it possible for folks to get to Florida, but they needed a fabulous place to stay. If they were going to buy into this, this luxury and this opulence, this exotic Florida coming from Chicago and Philadelphia, New York, um, Nova Scotia, they had to have a great place to stay. So that's why Plant got into the hotel business. And he had a total of eight hotels, also part of the Plant system. And his first one was the Inn at Port Tampa. So, and in this picture, you can sort of see it's right next to the rail line. So this was down at the port. Here's the rail line. Ships were on the other side. The inn, it's over the water. It's on stilts over the water. And one of the selling points of, of this vacation was you could go fishing outside your window, just cast a rod or a reel, a line out the window. If you caught something, you could give it to the cook and have it cooked up for breakfast. So that was one of the, the fun features advertising the inn at Port Tampa. He also had a hotel in Kissimmee. Of course, the Tampa Bay Hotel. One over in Seminole. Then his was the Punta Gorda Hotel, Hotel Bellevue, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Ocala House and Fort Myers. So those were his eight hotels. And out of, out of all eight, the Tampa Bay Hotel is the only one that still stands in its entirety. Um, fortunately, a, a part of the Bellevue has been preserved, uh, but the Tampa Bay Hotel is the only one that is intact. And we're very fortunate for that because it's actually a fabulous architectural structure. So here we see an early construction. They started building the Tampa Bay Hotel in 1888, and it opened in 1891, so it took three years. And this is early construction. You can see the, the middle section. It's a rectangular shape going up. And I want to point out the swing bridge in the, the foreground here. You can sort of see the, the base that then the bridge pivots on. Today it's been replaced with a drawbridge. But putting in this bridge was a part of Plant's deal with the city of Tampa. He wanted to build the hotel on the west bank of the Hillsborough River. Downtown Tampa is over here on the east bank. But at the time, there was just a ferry going across the river. And Plant said, I'm going to put in this hotel. But if I'm going to do that, you need to put in a bridge so that people can easily get over to the hotel, not just the tourists, but the city as well. So the city uh, board of trade agreed they would put in a bridge if Plant built the hotel. So that's, that's the early swing bridge. And I like this photo. This is showing the minarets being constructed, and it shows the scaffolding going up. 
which I really like for our school groups because it, it lets them know how structures like this were built before the cranes that right now in downtown Tampa are, are ubiquitous. So I like that for, for that feature. But it's also fun just to see how the minarets are going up. And that's something that I'm going to point out. Plant's original plan was just to have a symmetrical re rectangular shaped building that ended here at the north end. Halfway through construction, he decided he needed to have a grand dining room. So he extended, he built a hall off this north end that curved um, with a solarium down to the dining room. And we'll see pictures of that in just a little bit. This is a photograph of some of the, the work crew, the construction crew. And it's also a really great photo because it shows the hand-carved gingerbread woodwork in the horseshoe arches. Those arches are a common theme in the architecture, but you can see the, the gingerbread woodworking. And I like it because they even put the horse in. So when Plant was done, he had a magnificent structure that was Moorish Revival was the architectural style with the minarets and the domes. You can see one dome there. Um, that, that style, it was inspired by um, Alhambra in Granada, Spain. So sort of a North African Moorish look. And he wanted something that was exotic. Because even though Florida was growing and developing by this time, it was still relatively small. It wasn't considered a destination like St. Augustine had become. And so to encourage folks to come to Tampa, part of it is you get to stay at this fabulous castle-like building. It's sort of, it's something that might be out of the Arabian Nights. And so um, lots of wonderful imagery showing that exotic flavor of the building. And this was a, an ad, it was a double page ad that later ran in Life magazine in 1904. And it also shows some of the exciting activities you can do. There's golf, bicycling, boating on the river, of course. And rooms were $5 a night. Most of the, the hotels that were in Tampa at this time, and there were only a few, were more like boarding houses. And they were about $2 a night. So rooms here were $5, uh, that was per room. The hotel did have 16 multiple room suites. And if you rented one of the suites, you were paying $5 per room. So for those of you who have been to the museum, you might recall the bedroom suite, it's three rooms. That was a whopping $15. A lot of money in the 1890s. As I tell our school groups, we have some pay records from the hotel and it shows that the gardeners were earning between a quarter and 75 cents a day, and the laundry workers, depending on your job, were earning a dollar a day, not an hour. So $15, because a lot of the kids think, I could stay here. <laughs> um, they put it into perspective for them a little bit. But this was just a breathtaking building from across the river looking downtown, so it created a real sense of arrival as you're pulling into Tampa, and there's this enormous red brick building with these silver minarets sticking up um, several stories into the sky. And this is another view. This is starting to show part of the gardens, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit. This is what was the front of the building. The side that faces the river was considered the back, sort of the, the yard for exploring and strolling. The front was the opposite side, and this is where the train would pull in. Plant put in a spur off the main line that would come across the river and pull up right to the hotel. And you can see those tracks right here that it would pull around. And these are two more of the domes. The largest dome on the building is over the dining room. And then these domes on the right-hand side is the music room, and on the left-hand side is the grand salon. And I'll show you pictures of that in just a minute. There's the train pulling up. And this whole project cost plant $2.5 million in the 1890s to build, and then another half a million to furnish. So a total of $3 million. And the fun thing about the train arriving at the door is when it would come and go, it was kind of a spectator sport. 
because the people who could afford to stay here were wealthy, were well known, and so you'd want to know who was coming and going. So you see this group of folks sitting here watching the comings and goings. So great for people watching. But once you arrived, you would go into the lobby and you would check in at the desk. And then this is the view across from the desk of the lobby. And if you go today and you go into the main part of the building, the main lobby, Esmeralda and her goat, the statue there on the, the settee, and then there's another um, bronze statue, almost life-size, on an opposite one. They're still there. So a lot of the lobby, the, the structure looks the same today. And Plant filled this with, again, these almost life-size bronzes, overstitched, fantastic furniture, very colorful oriental rugs. Oh, this shows you, there's the spinning girl. Um, the oriental rugs and ceramics, you can kind of see them in the back. So it was really a, a visual feast. This is the Grand Salon, one of those domed rooms off the main lobby. This was more like a, a formal sitting room for the hotel. So on a rainy day, if you weren't out strolling in the grounds, you might sit here and just, again, enjoy pleasant conversation or look at the beautiful array of decorative arts that the plants spent half a million dollars to buy. Um, you have, oh, yeah, there you go. Wonderful mirrors, tremendously large mirrors. And you've got these ceramics that uh, that's actually a Chinese water jug and they electrified it. They put a light bulb on it and a huge lampshade. We have two of those in the museum. And um, the carpeting, most of the carpeting in the hotel, you can see it was area rugs on pine floors because that was more practical. In the 1890s, we didn't have our Dyson vacuums or whatever style, whatever brand you use. You had to take them, roll them up, take them out, shake them out. But wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, you can see that there's this lion pattern on the carpet. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting reinforced elegance, opulence, wealth, that you could afford to have carpet from wall to wall. Also figure out how to clean it. Um, so Plant did have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in a couple of the main public rooms. And we have a sample of that when you come to the museum in one of our exhibit rooms, we do have a sample of the original wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. But just an eclectic style because Plant purchased furniture from all over the world from Asia, Europe, Africa, um, and so all of that is represented in the styles of the decor. This is the music room. This is the other domed room that was on the, the entry side of the hotel. And the music room provided daily concerts. There was an orchestra that Plant would bring in every year. They would stay on campus, and um, they had daily concerts, sometimes in the music room, sometimes on the veranda. And then there would be dances in the evenings. Now I mentioned Plant added that long hallway down to the dining room. This is a view looking down the hallway toward the solarium. And it's maybe hard to see, but the windows are almost ceiling to floor. Huge windows. Because even on a chilly January morning, it um, might be a little cold to be out for a stroll in the gardens but you want to enjoy Florida's sun. You could walk down the solarium. There were also seats, and, and the warmth coming through would warm the space. And then there were plants, sort of like a greenhouse, to bring the, the exterior atmosphere interior without being outside in the chilly cold. But lots to look at as you stroll this 150-foot long corridor down to the dining room. In the dining room, talk about a visual and experiential feast. That was the dining room could seat 800 guests. And from the minute you stepped into the, the dining room, you were stimulated. You had fabulous um, Limoges and Wedgwood china on the tables. You had the beautiful plate silver. You had the crystal. Um, you had the, the presentation of eight, 10 courses presented to the table. Everybody dining was, of course, dressed for dinner. So you had that too. You would be seated at the table. Conversation was part of the experience to savor. It wasn't a 20 minute deal. You would sit for two to three hours enjoying, um, savoring each bit of 
of your experience. And up in the balcony, remember this had the largest dome on the building. Up in this balcony is where musicians would sit and they would provide dinner music because their music would float up and reverberate off the dome and then come down into the dining room to create dinner atmosphere. So you didn't have your smart speaker to play whatever it was you wanted. You would have musicians. And it was just the, the height of elegance. And oh, I, I would mention that Plant also brought in world famous chefs each season because to have a celebrity chef at your hotel really made an impact. That was an advertising point. And so one year the pastry chef was from Delmonico's in New York, which is a very well-known restaurant. One of the, the main rooms also on the first floor is the writing and reading room. This is one that if you've been to the museum, we're fortunate that this room is part of the museum. It's the most authentic room in the entire building because we have the majority of the original furniture and wall decor, and we have the historic photos to document that. So in, in the interpretation of the museum, to know that the artifacts that we have, most of them, are original to the hotel, we rely heavily on these historic photos. And so with this particular room, the writing and reading room, we're very fortunate that we are able to recreate it as it was in the 1890s. And we have a couple different views of the room. And so the writing and reading room was sort of like the business center in today's hotels, just no email and fax machines. But you would be able to write your letters, compose a telegraph. The hotel did have a telegraph office, so you could compose those there. And also discuss day's events. There was a newspaper rack at the back end of, of the room. And what's really fascinating about this room is when you go, it's the wall color is sort of a yellow color, and that is a recreation of the original wall color. We had a grant about 15, 20 years ago now to do a paint analysis at various points in the room, scraping the layers of paint. They went down 17 layers. To the very first layer, they were able to analyze the color and the composition, and we were able to recreate it. So even that yellow wall color um, is is authentic to the room from the 1890s. And I, I love to ask my school children that question, you know, how do we know that this yellow is the right color? Because none of our photographs, photographs weren't color back then. So it's a great way to help um, our visitors to understand that the building is a wonderful artifact in and of itself, in addition to our historic photographs and, and the objects. Now, how many of you have a basement? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so the Tampa Bay Hotel did have a basement. And that is, if you've been there today, the University of Tampa uses it as a sandwich and coffee shop called the Rathskeller. But when this was a hotel, it was the bar and billiard room. So this is a view of the billiard tables down there. There was also a shoe shine and a, and a hairdressing salon. That's a view of the bar. So very fascinating that, and especially so close to the river, but the building had a hotel or had a basement. And it's, it's really cool because um, the space is still there today. It doesn't look anything like this, but it's still there today. This is a view of one of the bedrooms. This is from the 1920s, but it gives you an idea of the, the furniture and the style. I prefer this view. This is um, from the 1890s, and it was something that, this is one of the photographs that's in our archives. It's been in our archives for years and years and years, but it was only within the last 10 years as we were looking at it because we were trying to identify, in the, in the museum, we have a settee, and it had always been said it was part of the museum, it was a, a hotel, it was original, but again, we, we weren't quite sure. So we were looking through old photographs, and it's this, this settee, this is the one in mind, and so we were looking at the back and the work here, the woodworking here, the curve of the arm. We were looking at all this detail. And as we were so focused on that detail, we suddenly realized there's wording here. And the words say, private parlor of HB plant. We'd had this photograph for years. Never, never saw that. 
And the only reason we saw it was because we were trying to document some furniture that it was original to the hotel. And there it is. We have a photograph of the plants suite in the hotel. Today, the president of the university uses their suite as his office. <laughs> but this is really great because you get to see the furniture and the layout, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. So for the guests staying at the hotel, one of the wonderful pastimes of the 1890s, early 1900s, was strolling through gardens. And so this is a view of the gardens in front of the hotel, and it also is a great shot of Tampa and how it's grown and developed in the years since the railroad came to town. And this is another view. Part of the gardens is very methodical. You plan it out. Mr. Plant hired a, a landscape architect, uh, Anton Fee, to design the gardens and care for all the plants because it wasn't just haphazard. He laid out different flower beds that would be aesthetic features and, and have different types of plants in them because not only as you're strolling through are you appreciating the tropical landscape, but they're meant to be conversation pieces to inspire thought and, and conversation between people as you're strolling through. So he had flower beds that spelled things. He also had fountains. And then down here by the river is a lined walkway with palms. And he had three glass conservatories on the grounds to help replenish the plants. Because plants sent Mr. Fee all over the world to gather plants um, that would do well in a tropical climate. Because this was also fascinating for folks who lived in northern climates. They couldn't grow some of these things, and certainly not outside. So it really was a conversation piece. And some of those landscape features, for example, this fountain, were designed to be aesthetically pleasing to have activities. This is also from the 20s. It's a ladies tea outside. But what plant installed was this cone-shaped rock formation with a fountain around it. And it has iridescent rocks and geodes. And it has, it has a fountain so that water shoots out cascades down on these iridescent rocks, and in the Florida sun, they'll sparkle and shimmer. And so this fountain was uh, dubbed the jewel box because it glittered like jewels. Plant had a power plant. He built a power plant on the grounds to electrify the building. All 511 rooms were electrified in 1891, but it also extended to the gardens. And that was, again, a feature to reinforce the amenities and the luxury and the opulence of the Tampa Bay Hotel. The hotel also had two elevators. They operated on hydraulics. They had a telephone system, and they had indoor hot and cold running water. So all these fabulous state-of-the-art technologies for the 1890s. And again, if the amenities and the exotic architecture and the fabulous decor wasn't enough, you definitely had to have things to do because the folks who were coming were usually staying for two to three weeks, maybe even months for the whole season. And also in Tampa, there, there still wasn't the entertainment. It wasn't the destination that the Tampa Bay area is now with sports. And the beaches were always here, but you have the sports and you have all the museums and you have all of the dining, everything that Tampa Bay offers, it wasn't here. So Plant built these things so people had things to do. The casino, which was a performance hall, was one of those things. During the day, there were floorboards down to create a stage, and he brought in international entertainers. Nellie Melba, Anna Pavlova, Booker T. Washington, Buffalo Bill and his Wild West show, John Philip Sousa. All these international superstars performed or spoke here at the casino. But then the floorboards could be removed, and there was a freshwater pool underneath, which was a much nicer alternative to the Hillsborough River. But then there were also lots of outdoor activities. He installed a tennis court, a race track, and these, these were competition quality courses as well. He, the hotel did host tennis, tennis tournaments as well as different racing events from horse racing, motorcycle racing, and eventually automobile racing. I mentioned bicycling. That was in one of the earlier 
in that advertisement, but there were miles of bicycle paths on the west side of the building. And then there was also a golf course. And he brought in Colonel John Gillespie, a Scotsman, to install, to design and install the golf course. He's also the one who put in the uh, first golf course down in Sarasota, which I believe was a two-hole golf course. Um, and later, Gillespie became the mayor of Sarasota. But he's here in the center. Now, Plant was somebody, he was interested in helping the development of Florida. He really wanted to promote the progress of Florida. Yes, he did make money doing it, but he really had the interest of Florida in mind. And so part of what he did was he would travel to international expositions and world, world's fairs, and he would construct displays of Florida products, encouraging people to see the, the fishing, to see the produce, the, the cigars, the lumber, all of these different things that were the agriculture that was coming out of Florida. And so he went to the Paris Expo of 1889, and the reason we have a picture of the Eiffel Tower is because the newspaper documented that in honor of 4th of July, Mr. Eiffel permitted Mr. Plant to fly the American flag at the top of the Eiffel Tower on the 4th of July, 1889. And at that time, that was the only time that a flag other than the French flag flew atop the Eiffel Tower. But it was while he was there in Paris at the exposition. Plant traveled to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. And this is actually a picture of the Florida exhibition booth. And so you can see that that appears to be wine that was produced. And then the other agricultural products. And you can see it says Florida across the top. So that's a picture of the display. And then the Cotton States and International Exposition of 1895. This one's really spectacular because Plant built a freestanding structure as his Florida display this year. This is a picture of it. It's a four-sided pyramid, and it has his plant system logo in the front. I wish we had a photograph of what was inside, but this is really cool because we have, the museum has a brochure from the Cotton States Expo that describes the plant pyramid, and it's constructed of phosphate. So he was there, he was promoting, again, Florida product phosphate, but he built the entire pyramid out of phosphate. And it, it must have been massive because these, these are doors that people, you can kind of get a scale. There's someone sitting on a bench, and there's a man walking away. It was something you walked into. But the other thing that Plant did that, that also really put Florida and Tampa Bay specifically on the map was the role that he played in the Spanish-American War, and specifically the role that the hotel played. Leading up to the Spanish-American War, to the US's involvement in the conflict, um, the, the government was looking for a point of embarkation. They knew that if they were going to get into a war, um, specifically in Cuba, they needed to have a close point to reach Cuba. And they looked at various places across around the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. And Plant, Plant sent someone to Washington to make the argument that Tampa should be selected. Part of that was Tampa was really concerned. They were worried that if the Spanish Armada happened to attack Florida, Tampa was worried they were a vulnerable spot. They had a port. Um, they were on the Gulf Coast. They were very close to Cuba. They wanted to make sure that they were protected. But the other thing was, Plant not only wanting to be protected, Plant made the argument, you know what, we would be a good point for the embarkation because we're relatively close. We've got the rail lines to bring troops and supplies into Tampa. I've got this great big hotel where all of the generals and the war correspondents, the officials can stay. And then the port's been developed. Large ships can come in and transport cargo and troops to Cuba. So eventually, the War Department does select Tampa as the point of embarkation, and the hotel becomes the headquarters for the US Army. On paper, that sounded fantastic. In reality, it was a big mess. Um, Plant only had one rail line coming into Tampa. 30,000 troops, plus all of the other ancillary people, the press and the officials that were coming into Tampa, plus the supplies, 
could not use one rail line. And so it just became a, a big old mess and congestion. But eventually, everybody got to the port. Everybody got onto ships. They embarked. The Cuban campaign happened. Um, but because Tampa had become the point of embarkation and the hotel was the headquarters for the military, it was in international papers for a number of weeks. So everybody around the world learned about Tampa Bay. Historically, it's, the building is significant because the Rough Riders, they were camped around the area. But this guy on the right, left, um, Theodore Roosevelt, he was here with the Rough Riders, and he camped with them. But his wife, Edith, came to visit while he was in Tampa. And Edith did not stay in one of the tents like what most of the soldiers were staying in. She, she was not camping in that. She was staying in the hotel. You can see the minarets in the background. She stayed in the hotel, and Roosevelt got special permission from Colonel Wood to be able to spend some evenings with Edith in the hotel as long as he was back with the troops in the morning. Um, and so the, the reason that we know he really did spend the night at the hotel was while he was there, he wrote two letters to family documenting that Edith had come to stay, she was staying in the big hotel, and he had special permission to stay there with her. So we know for a fact Roosevelt spent the night at the Tampa Bay Hotel. But like I said, those 30,000 other troops, they weren't so lucky. They were camped in very, very primitive, basic um, structures like this, basically a canvas tarp over poles. And um, out in the element, this was summer of 1898, so it's raining, it's hot, mosquitoes, bugs, sand fleas, all kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that's what the experience was for those troops who were here. And then some other individuals, like the Red Cross, they stayed in the hotel. They also stayed down at the inn at Port Tampa. And then, um, and Clara Barton was among them. She's in the dress here, right there. And then... Um, some of the notable war correspondents who came were Frederick Remington and Richard Harding Davis and Stephen Crane. And they're pictured in the bottom right. So it's, it's all of these things that sort of culminated so that in 1898, Success Magazine actually referred to Plant as the King of Florida. Because at that point, he had done more for the development and advancement of Florida. He'd invested more time and energy and resources than anyone else. Now, yes, he was surpassed. Plant died in 1899, and so he was definitely surpassed. But by 1898, he really had done the most for the development of Florida. And speaking of people who surpassed him, you may have heard of Henry Flagler. Um, People always ask, were they friends, enemies? What was the story there? You know, we, we don't have Henry Plant's personal journal. I wish we did. That would be fabulous. But what we do have is some other primary sources. And two of the pieces we have that really help us to think that they were friendly, friendly rivals, um, but in a, in a more positive way than a negative way. This Orange Blossom newsletter, this was um, something produced by the Tampa Bay Hotel. And in 1898, in March, it ran an article saying that Mr. and Mrs. Plant were going on a 10-day cruise in the Bahamas with the Flaglers, so on a private ship. So it wasn't just they were all on the same big 20,000-person Princess Cruise Line um, where they might not have run into each other. They, they were personal guests of the Flaglers. And then um, the, uh, the obituary of Mr. Plant that ran in the New York Times in 1899 it mentions the pallbearers, and among them was Henry Flagler. So those are two pretty convincing pieces that, that we feel that they were friendly. And then just to, to share this, uh, we, we're always learning new information about the Tampa Bay Hotel and Henry Plant. And one of the fascinating things we learned was that Plant was one of the um, first railroad men on the East Coast to implement hospital cars while he was building the railway designated rail cars that were strictly for hospital emergency purposes, sort of like a, a rail ambulance, that if there was an injury that occurred along the rail line because 
laying track is a very dangerous and, and deadly job. Um, if something, if there was an accident on the line, he would dispatch, a, dis, a rail car would do, be dispatched to that point with a specialized medical surgeon, doctor, who's trained specifically in rail-related injuries um, to that scene to, to treat the patient. Because prior to this, basically if something happened and you're 100 miles down the track, um, not near anything, your only hope was really wait until the next rail car came, rail train came by, put the person on the train and send them along and hope for the best. With this, it really improved survival rates of people who were injured on, on rail lines because it really, it, it had three areas. It had a triage, surgery, and a recuperation that was all sterilized equipment specifically for this and like I said a doctor so it was really an interesting piece to find out about that part of his management style um, with the rail lines so that is that is it basically we're very fortunate that the Tampa Bay Hotel still stands um, his legacy is still seen throughout the city of Tampa uses one of his steamships on the city seal um, it's the mascot and then Probably the most glamorous story of Mr. Plant is related to his son, Morton. You may have heard of Morton, Morton Plant Meese Hospital. Morton Plant donated the money to build the first hospital there, which is why the hospital is named for him. But something else Plant, Morton Plant did was he had an, a home, a brownstone on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And at one point, his wife, Maisie, fell in love with a double strand of pearls by Cartier. Morton was not in love with the price tag. And so he negotiated with Cartier to trade his Fifth Avenue brownstone for the pearls. And Cartier was OK with that because they were looking for an uptown um, display room, showroom, for their jewelry store. And so if you ever go to New York City now to Cartier's Fifth Avenue showroom, there's a plaque on the wall that says this was the home of Morton and Maisie Plant, and they traded it for a strand of pearls. So. Um, that's just kind of a fun story. So I thank you all for your time. I'm, I'm afraid I ran a little long, but um, any questions? Yes? I do. I have uh, one. Um, where was the hotel in relation to Fort Brook? Fort Brook. So Fort Brook was on the eastern side of, of Tampa. Let me see if I can. And the hotel was on the, the western side of the river. And then Fort Brook, if you're familiar with downtown moving toward the Channel Side area where the cruise ships come in, it was located in that area. So I don't think it actually says on here. But this, the, so here's the river, and the hotel is here. This is downtown. Fort Brook was in this area. Actually, this side, sorry. Down here, along where it's now Channel Side. So the hotel was over here, and Fort Brook was down there. When did it stop being the hotel and became the university? Thank you. That's um, something that's a very interesting story. So Plant died in 1899, and his wife and son were not interested in the hotels, not interested in the railroad. His son, Morton, was interested in the steamships, so he remained, remained involved in that part of the, the company. Um, when Plant died, it was estimated that he was worth between 17 and 24 million in 1899. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Um, and so it took a while to settle the estate, something of that amount, and especially since um, his wife was not Morton's mother. There was a little discrepancy, and plus Plant had put in his will that he actually wanted everything to go to his grandson, who was, I think, six. Um, so they, they had to sort some things out. But when they finally got things sorted out, the city of Tampa decided to purchase the building because it had become sort of a, a social center for things with the hotel, the big ballroom and the dining room. Those were used for conferences and, and national and um, statewide organization annual events. The city was using it. Um, for example, the local department store had used the dining room for their holiday party. Uh, the casino, the Tampa Bay Casino, those shows were open to the community. And then some other community organizations would also 
I assume, rent the space to have events. So the grounds had become a community space. So the city thought, well, we'll, we'll buy it. So in 1905, when once the estate had all been settled, the city of Tampa bought the hotel, and they ran it as a hotel up until 1932. In 32, it closed, and it sat empty for about a year. In 1933, that's when the um, Tampa College, it was a two-year junior college that was operating classes out of Hillsborough High School, approached the city about leasing the building because they were wanting to, to transition into a four-year college, university, and they needed a permanent place. They, they needed residents for students, a library space. They, they needed their own space. So they approached the city about um, leasing the building. So in 1933, that's when the university moved in, and the city said, still owning the building, the city said, well, we want to establish a museum to, for the city. So that south wing, that first floor south wing, needs to be a museum, and you can use the rest of the building. So to this day, the city of Tampa still owns the former Tampa Bay Hotel. The university leases the building, and they can use the entire building except for that section that's been designated as a museum. So the museum and the university have been in that space since 33. And part of that lease is, you know, the university does not pay a bunch of money. I think it was a 99-year lease, and it was a dollar a year kind of thing, um, providing the university pay for the upkeep, which that's a lot. Um, and, and that's really why most of the former hotels have, have gone away. Um, we think the inn blew away in the hurricane in the 1920s. Um, I know one of the hotels burnt down, maybe two, but most of them have been demolished because they were just too big. And that would have been the case with the Tampa Bay Hotel if um, the city hadn't thought, well, you know, we, we can run it as a hotel for a little while. And, and then even when they closed it, instead of raising it and putting up something else, they thought, you know, the city still seems to kind of congregate here. Let's just wait and see. So it's really, really fortunate that the university saw that as a, as a space to be used and that they've worked out this agreement with the city. Yes, ma'am. I just had a comment that you fully illustrated the legend behind the man as well as just the philanthropy that he uh, endowed to generations of Floridians. Uh, just the foresightedness of you know, yeah. his ability to see the, the interconnectedness of the railway, the hotel system. Um, it, it was beautifully done. I appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, and it's something, I, I mean, I, I must admit, I like Henry. Um, and, and it is, it's a question that we get, well, was he a robber baron? Was he a carpetbagger? And I mean, there, there are some ways he did profit from the development in Florida, but he really had the interest of Florida's development in mind. He continued throughout his lifetime to, to continue to invest and promote the, the, the positive development, not just I can get in there, I can make a quick buck, and then I'm out. So, so we really do feel like he was really invested in Florida's progression as opposed to just seeing it as a profit. Yes? I have a question. I heard Babe Ruth as long as home run there. Is that true? Yes. So um, although it's not true that he signed his contract in the, the Grand Salon, um, we, there was a newspaper article um, I don't know, it's maybe been 15 years ago, that said he signed his contract in, in, the, or in the dining room. He didn't. We, we've checked with Cooperstown the, and Babe Ruth's archives and things like that. He was not in, the ta in Tampa when that occurred. But his longest home run, yes. There, um, the racetrack, the picture of the racetrack, when Plant was building his sort of all-in-one destination, he was trying to install sports complex that would be tournament quality because he wanted to not only encourage tourists to come as spectators, but he wanted to be, bring in big names to compete here that would then draw audiences. So with his golf course and his tennis courts, he had those tournaments. But the racetrack, the racetrack in the center, there was the baseball field. 
And, um, and so the grandstands, people could watch the games there. And so in the um, plant never got to see this part, but in the 1920s, the um, Chicago Cubs and the Washington Senators held spring training. They stayed at the hotel and they had spring training here on the field. And we know that because out of 40 years of hotel operation, we have four guest registers, <laughs> but we're really, really fortunate. That the one we have from the 20s is one of the seasons when the baseball teams were here. So we have the records of um, the players who I think it was five later became future Baseball Hall of Famers who stayed here. Um, but anyway, as part of that, yes, Babe Ruth was here during spring training. They were doing an exhibition game, and he did. He hit his longest home run. And if any of you are familiar either with evangel uh, evangelists, uh, yeah, evangelists or um, baseball history, Billy Sunday, who was a baseball player as a young man, I want to say that was in the um, late 1890s, early 1900s. He was a baseball player, pretty good, but gave it up, found religion, and um, became an evangelist. He would go around doing revivals. And uh, he was very popular here in Tampa. And so he happened to be in town for a revival the same time Babe Ruth was playing that exhibition game. So if Billy Sunday was in town for a revival, and, it, and the game wasn't on Sunday, he would umpire the game. And so the local newspapers reported that at that game, Billy Sunday threw out the first pitch of that game. And so when Babe hit that longest home run, they gave that ball to Billy Sunday. So it's really, it's really kind of interesting. And that story and, and understanding Billy Sunday and his significance and the connection to Babe Ruth and the grounds, that one's also another one that has come out over the years. We have a postcard in the collection that um, is written by a guest and, um, and she wrote to a friend named Gert back home about what she was doing and she was talking about she was watching these exhibition games. The Washington Senators were here. Play, they were going to play the Chicago Cubs next week. But Billy Sunday's in town and he umpired the game. So that was where we got the idea, well, who's Billy Sunday? So then we started digging about Billy Sunday and then when we were looking into Babe Ruth's longest home run, oh, there's Billy Sunday. So it all, kind of all the little puzzle pieces that we continue to connect um, was really quite, it's fun. Like, it, we, we never stop learning. And that's, that's why a random postcard that we thought was interesting because she was talking about the exhibition games when we started looking at the name she mentioned was really, um, it's just fun. So, yes, ma'am. Do you have an archive so that people would be allowed to come in and research? We have an archives. Um, right now, with, with COVID, it's, it's very complicated. Um, but, but it is something you can reach out to our curator mm -hmm. and, and ask, and, and we can work something out. Any other questions? Yes. I believe Morton was mostly raised by his grandparents. Yes. And, and in turn, Morton's son also was kind of raised by the grandparents too. What was the reasoning behind that? A lot of it was the time period. That was just something that affluent families didn't raise their own children. Um, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't have more nannies involved. Um, it was also a matter of with Morton, Morton being a young man, Henry, there is some question whether Henry had maybe some emotional concerns because not only in 1861 with the Civil War breaking out, but he lost his wife, Morton's mother. Um, and so if there were some emotional issues um, and just how does a man of that time period raise a son, it's not done. Um, so grandparents are the ones who can do that. Um, and also just having some connection then with with his wife Ellen and, and his maternal grandparents, having some family connection because family was really important to Henry. He, he was a self-made man. He was not from money. So he didn't grow up with that idea of nannies, um, but I think it was a strain losing Ellen, the Civil War, developing his business, seeing where he wanted to go and, and realizing that, that he wasn't one who could raise a young son. 
and family being important. So I think that's why Morton was sent to spend a lot of time with both maternal and paternal grandparents um, for some of that stability too because you know, Plant was a northerner working in the South during the Civil War. There are some questions about how he was able to do that and how he then was also able to leave the South as the Civil War was looking like it was going to end and go in favor of the North and how he was able to basically not lose what he had built up. So there are some questions about how he was able to do that and, and we're not entirely certain but we know it wasn't a direct route of he didn't just leave Augusta and go to um, uh, DC or New York. He kind of had a circuitous route through Europe. <laughs> um, so, so there are some questions as to how he was able to do that and, and I think maybe he just realized that was not a stable process and, and just he wasn't capable of doing it. So grandparents would be more stable. Yeah. With Morton, I'm not sure because Morton then, he did come up in affluence. You know, by, by the time Morton was coming along, his father had made money and had, um, had established himself. And so Morton grew up wealthy. And, and so maybe he was just kind of following along in that. And plus, Morton, I'm not as familiar with his wives, but I know uh, his son Henry's mother was not Morton, or was not Maisie. So there was also an additional marriage and things like that. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I definitely enjoyed it. So thank you for coming this morning. And again, Alex, thank you for inviting me.